Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks for being invited to the prestigious Summer Academy of uh, Salzburg. I am very honored and I enjoy also, amid so many Mozart and other operas and Rococo, uh, to <coughs> encounter such a dangerous subject like we have today. I thank uh, both Sabine Vogel and uh, the uh, director of the uh, Summer Academy. I just wanted to tell the last book which you mentioned um, is now appearing in, uh, in August in Harvard University Press. It's in an English edition with the title Florence and Baghdad, Renaissance Art and Arab Science. So just since you mentioned it. The publication of new books which are entitled World Art History or Global Art History may provide the impression that the two terms can be used as synonyms. In order to challenge this impression, I will embark on a chronicle and a description rather than a theory how the two terms World Art and Global Art came into being, how they changed their meaning, and what they reveal about the history of ideas and the inherent notion of time. Terminology, it will become clear, is a key for opening up the framework of conventions and intentions. One and the same notion, we will see, changes in meaning and reference as we move on in time. I have watched art history long enough in order to acknowledge its dramatic changes in practice. The title of my lecture will be, It is Difficult. Uh, I, I like very much this artist, his uh, Chile-born Alfredo Jan, who uh, uh, reused a quotation from William Carlos Williams, who said, that it is difficult to get news from a poem, which I would apply to the following exercise to control the relation of global news and global art, of art and its time. I would like to arrange my talk into four parts and to speak first of world art and its concept before turning to global art using a famous Paris exhibition, which you all know as an intermezzo. An intermezzo in which world art was turned into global art. Before, in the last part, I speak of art history today and its challenges. So let's begin with world art. World art was coined as a colonial notion for the art of the others, of the pre-modern, and thus to exclude it by inclusion, exclude it from the modern art concept, and yet to include it as a different art, also to be collected in different museums, the study field of ethnography. Thus, world art was conceived as non-Western, and therefore as another kind of art, which sometimes may have been looked at with a nostalgia born out of disillusion with the modern. The Vienna School of Art History, and here I uh, remind you of the genius Loki, not Salzburg, but Vienna. The Vienna School of Art History, a hundred years ago, favored the notion of Weltkunst, world art, as an expanded field of disciplinary com competence. In this sense, Heinrich Glück contributed to Josef Strzegowski's Festschrift in the year 1934, the study entitled Hauptwerke der Weltkunst, Masterpieces of World Art, 34. In Germany, the magazine The Kunstauktion, founded in 1927, was relabeled Weltkunst, World Art, in 1930, and thus revealed the interest for world art as an item for collectors who would look for it in auctions. 
In our times, the School of World Art Studies at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, like its counterpart in Leiden, represents a new educational project intended to include the arts of other times and other cultures in the teaching program of art history. John O'Neill, who for a long time taught in Norwich, with a great number of experts, published the Atlas of World Art, which you see here, reaching from Neolithic times to the present, in 2004. He thus paid a tribute to the legacy of the Sainsbury Collection, which was built up in the spirit of modern aesthetics and to which we will turn in a moment. Uh, Juno Nyans also founded with the Getty Fund Means a World Art Library in the same place. <coughs> the relation of world art to modern art was conceived in two bi basic notions, of which the first of which, well, you know it all, is of course primitivism, so-called primitivism as it was represented and exhibited for the last time, I say for the last time in this confidence, in the MoMA show from 1984, with the subtitle, The Affinity of the Tribal and the Modern, meaning an affinity of artists who would appropriate primitive art in their own work. Affinity with the primitive was only pretended by turning their artifacts into a work of art. So to speak, the primitives were seen with the modern eyes as inspiration and thus in a colonial spirit. <coughs> After the fact, the similarity was celebrated as an unforeseen revelation. Like uh, on the cover, you have seen a Max Ernst sculpture to the right with a, so to speak, surprising similarity to the mask to the left. And it is interesting that already in 1935, the newly founded MoMA, the first museum of modern art ever, staged this show here, the African Negro art as an aesthetic adventure. The discovery of analogies justified modern art as being the legitimate heir of timeless forms. And you see here, I could give you any amount and you can enjoy the comparison. One of the very old exercises of art history to do a good comparison and compare similarities. And if you have similarities, you are happy. And so this exercise of art history was a long game which I have not to uh, display any longer. <coughs> Now this comparison paved the way to the second fashion of world art by juxtaposing it with modern art as witness that art had always been modern and always been form more than content. So the form was so sweet, the strong message here. The Sainsbury family was an example for a modern taste that enjoyed primitive art for the same reasons as modern art, collecting the one and the other side by side. If you can read here at the bottom, the Robert and Lisa Sainsbury collection features works spanning 5,000 years of human creativity. Modern work by artists such as Henry Moore, John Davis, and so on, alongside art from Africa, the Pacific, and you may note that there are no names in Africa Pacific. So names only have the, the one part. And so in this case, you see here Henry Moore's culture at the bottom right, and you see what they collected elsewhere. The confession to have collected work spanning 5,000 years of human creativity was average and standard for a collector still in post-war times. But times changed. And the School of World Art Studies recently tried to introduce living artists from Africa, to give just an example, as contemporary artists in residence, and at the same time expected them to react to the existing collection in a manner which I would say 
could not really work well and for which there was no concept. You see, this artist in residence reacted to the masks in the showcases. The same problem with newly introduced invading contemporaries happened in the British Museum when the Department of Ethnography, again with rich collections from the same Sainsbury collection, recently started, as you can read, this is a, uh, an inscription, a text which is displayed in the Africa Department, recently started to, I quote, actively collect contemporary art and to collaborate with artists, mostly of African origin. Thus a turning point was reached when post-colonial art invaded a collection from colonial times and, as a result, created a crisis for the collecting principles of Western ethnographic museums. But world art is not necessarily primitive and was never necessarily primitive art like African and Oceanic art. Thus, the, the same British Museum staged blockbuster shows of Chinese or Iranian art in recent years such as to underscore its presumption to be, I quote, not only a museum of the world, but a museum for the world, to quote a statement by its director. And you see here the big exhibition of the Chinese terracotta army with the title um, First Emperor. But I have chosen this exhibition for quite another reason. A bookshop in Great Russell Street across the British Museum involuntarily testified to a new state of things when in its window it placed two books which reiterated subjects of world art besides a third book which only became possible with globalization. In other words, the catalogue of the Terracotta Army to the left, a book about Chinese art treasures in the middle, besides the third book that invited the reader to visit studios of contemporary Chinese artists, a book inconceivable 30 years ago. What looks like the same subject, namely Chinese art, in fact divides world art from global art, as it introduces the arrival of Chinese contemporary artists in the global art world. Of course, this is only one example of many possible. We now have reached a critical point. The MoMA exhibition was still a colonial project, but happened in post-colonial times. World art, represented by African masks and the like, and modern art, represented by the early avant-garde, still had perpetuated the asymmetry between the looking and the looked at, but between active artists and passive objects fabricated by artisans. But it was only in 1989 that Johnny Bear Martin, it was already mentioned today, created the first really global <laughs> exhibition of contemporary art. This is a quote, because this is from a press which says, Première exposition réellement mondiale d'art contemporain. I do not want to discuss the exhibition. Once again, you see Johnny Bear Martin to the left to the upper left, but only wish to indicate the, its key role for the transition from modern art and modern art and world art, from the transition of world art to contemporary art. Martin had selected 50 artists. He called them in order to avoid struggle, magicians instead of artists, who always had remained in the ethnographic realm of world art, beside other 50 artists who had been defined as modern or postmodern. Thus Martin was laying down a time-old barrier, but he was accused of continuing the colonial game of the authentic and of choosing the wrong artists to meet the established Western colleagues, traditional artists, instead of professional. As a result, the modern artists lost their ticket modern in the same exhibition and the others lost their ticket world art. Both parties became, mostly against their will, contemporaries with name and passport. The ones no longer looked modern, and the others no longer looked ethnic. 
But the real problem was that the show neglected the fact that professional artists in the Western sense from former world art already had entered the stage and replaced the former artisans. Now there is so much literature about this exhibition that I could not resist to give you a very fresh report from one of the participating artists who had no theory about the exhibition at all, but was just simply happy. And this was the already quoted Alfredo Jahn. I quote, I was watching some artists at work in the vast open space of La Villette. One morning there was Esther Malangu from South Africa painting her house. That's what you see here. <clears throat> in front of her, Cyprian Tokudagba from Binnen. In front of, next to both of them, a group, and this was the real scandal of the exhibition. It was not the usual thing to confront such a thing, Richard Long, an Australian earth painting, but he, Alfredo Gare was happy too. Next to both of them, a group of Australian Aboriginal artists were working on their sand painting. And five meters further in the back, Richard Long was making one of his large mud drawings. What a sight. They were so close together and so far apart at the same time. This show, I continue quoting, yeah, raises many important issues, but we are so self-centered that we don't see them. Did we even realize that they have names? Until now, the issues I raised were viewed only by a Western audience in a Western context. In Magicien, there were art and artists from non-Western countries, from countries which were the subject of my concerns, says Alfred ja, and installations like in Nigeria. Also, it was still a Western context. The context had broadened, and with that came the potential for new, for new audiences. For me, it was an extraordinary experience. So far, Alfredo Ja. We thus can call the magician's show an intermezzo, in which the roles were changed. And if you want, a read the passage with all its stages which marks a moment in time and a stage in terminology, which would have been impossible before <laughs> and no longer was possible thereafter, when globalism leveled the territory of art. Both modern art and also world art looked suddenly old, but the new step led into, the, into no man's land, where we still are and where we navigate with the help of provisional terminology, such as global or post-colonial art, provisional terminology. The creation, you see, uh, there is not only Magicien de la Terre, there are many other exhibitions by Jean-Libert Martin, like the Düsseldorf exhibition, where you see again uh, Richard Long uh, towering above a so-called tribal artist uh, from, from India, and so he always wanted to go back to the 1989 Magicien, but of course the time had continued further. And the creation of the Musée du Quai Pondy was a step backwards, as it excluded contemporary professional artists from Africa and Oceania, and instead mystified a past age of the art premier, of the first arts. So I think when it opened, it was clear, brand clear, clear, that there, something was missing in the whole museum, contemporary artists, completely missing. But then they have realized this problem, and now there are exhibitions like uh, Giatine d'Argent's exhibition, Autre Maître de Lande, Other Masters from India, Création Contemporaine des Adivasi, which uh, Jain um, staged last year in the same um, Cape Horn Lee. When the Cape Horn Lee in 2006 opened, uh, there were professional artists from Africa, like Shiri Zamba, already a long time widely collected and exhibited. Shiri Zamba grew out of an urban popular culture in the former Zaire. 
In the magician show, he represented his ego and identity as artist in a programmatic self-portrait. This, I think, therefore, I like him. Other, he is a very controversial artist, but in this case, he, he does he performs the program. He represents himself as being there with name and face. The anonymous artisan from world art had become a face with a name and a contemporary with a professional career. Bogumil Jewski, the Polish anthropologist in Canada, called Chirizamba a black Gauguin, in that he studied the modern West with an ethnographic curiosity, an inverse Gauguin's trip. Be it as it may, globalism proved to be a road of no return and also provided a place for artists like Chirizamba, who no longer could be labeled with word art. Also, the intermezzo of the Paris show, after the intermezzo, sorry, I now reach the second part, dedicated to global art, which had its entry in the art world in the same year, 1989. But global art, and here this is something which you will, I hope, will enjoy my exercise in terminology, but global art was not yet called global art, but was still called, or again was called, world art, and therefore borrowed the old term world art with a new meaning. As we see in, uh, in Jean-Louis Pradel's book from 1982, international modern art, in its recent extension to non-Western countries, for a few years was called world art, before this term disappeared. This is a confusing state of things, but the confusion was in the 1980s general. So this was a book which in included some more non-Western artists than before, but that was all. <coughs> also the Sydney Biennial from 1988, a year before the Paris show, announced, and you, if, if you can see in the lower bottom right, announced a view of world art 1940 to 1988, thus using the same time span with the show Westkunst in 1981 had presented at Cologne for staging modern Western art, including the US. You see, you cannot trust terminology, but here it was a cautious step beyond The Sydney catalog explains the purpose of the exhibition, 1988, I quote, as an exhibition of contemporary art from here and overseas, and, I quote, as an attempt to view key elements in world art from an Australian perspective instead of a perspective from Paris or New York. I mentioned in passing that 1988 was also the bicentennial of the white occupation of Australia, which led to a big controversy about the participation of Aborigines artists at the show, a problem that was solved with the compromise of commissioning 200 Aborigines pails, death pails, symbolizing the 200 years of oppression. Uh, this, uh, by the way, is a commission which now opens the newly inaugurated National Gallery in Canberra, which has 17 or 18 new spaces <coughs> just for Aboriginal art, but not as world art, but as contemporary Australian art. The, the official entry of Indigenous Australians as contemporary artists happened only a few years thereafter, when the first Asia-Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art launched in 1993 by the Queensland Gallery Prispo, changed the map of the art world completely and forever. Already the New York exhibition Dreamings had paved the way in 1988. Um, and there is in this catalog of the first Asia-Pacific Triennial an interesting map in a map of Australia, which shows at the East Coast 
the big new cities where art centers are to be placed. But then in the middle of Australia, it shows three spaces where Aborigines are working. And therefore, this is a reshaping of the art map of Australia of some consequence. And in the same catalog, you see that in the middle are three Aborigines women included among the nine artists from Australia. This all happened in a few years span uh, and therefore shows the shift in terminology, in concept, and anything else. Now, but let me return to the year 1989. In its July edition, the magazine Art in America presented the new state of things on its cover with the NASA shot of the Earth as the global issue. The subtitle explains this neologism as the title of a symposium. But the symposium never took place. It was in fact a collection of interviews in which 14 artists were asked about their response to the global extension of the art world. The artists labeled as peripatetic and thus as nomads, like the Chile-born Alfredo Ya, were in the majority Westerners, but also they felt that a new experience and a new concept of contemporaneity was emerging in the arts. Coevalness was supplanting the former divide between world art and modern art which came out of use in favor of a global contemporaneity as a new artist's identity. In the same edition of Art in America, we are offered a lengthy description and analysis of the Exhibition Magicien in Paris, and finally, pub also the publication of the first critical view of Aboriginal art as a new and controversial issue in contemporary art. So you see, 88, 89 are years which we will also show in our Karlsruhe exhibition in the documentation as those years in which things are changing. The definition of global art, however, was not yet acceptable for everybody. As a result, the German magazine Kunstforum, two years thereafter, in January 92, returned to the term Weltkunst, but linked it to the explanatory definition of global culture, global culture. The editor, Paolo Bianchi from Switzerland, reminded the readers that a new kind of ethnicity was in the making. As the 113th edition of the magazine had noted, it was heralding a multicultural society but the notion of a global art world was ready and soon became so current that we can leave it at that and wait for the arrival of new terms, such as a hope post-global, which only in French anthropology has become an issue as yet, but will be of importance, I guess, in the future. Now, let me add the fourth and final part as an epilogue and speak about art history's challenge by the new global art world. So, you see, we first had then we had the intermezzo magicien, then we saw the arrival of global art and now uh, the situation of art history in the new art world. I will be very brief and only mention two books. The first one being a book by the American David Carrier with the title A World Art History and Its Objects. It indeed deals with world art as no contemporary artist is even mentioned. On its cover we see a 19th century painting by the French Jean-Léon Giraud 
illustrating a carpet merchant in the Orient, thus epitomizing what Edward Said has coined Orientalism in the sense of Western colonial gaze of the Orient. Said would have enjoyed this picture if he didn't know it anyway. Uh, David Carrier, the author, mentions Said when he speaks about the need to know, I quote, how to represent other cultures, understanding them on their own terms. He paraphrases a book by Richard Wolheim, Art and Its Objects, a book where, as Carrier complains, all the examples come from Europe, despite the title Art and Its, Object, its Objects. Carrier considers his own book, I quote, as a prolegomena for a full visual history of all cultures, in which we also will understand Western art history better when seen with the eyes of, for example, Chinese art historians, who would introduce parallels or counterparts of Western art from their own culture. So the most, the most important things here as he proposes. He is a philosopher by formation. He is a close friend of Arthur Danto. But what he says is practically the following. We need to understand Western art history better than having it looked up with eyes from other cultures. That's what he says. But this, as Carrier insists, will be a political and not a methodological problem. It's not a problem of method, but who is allowed, who is justified of saying what. Therefore, also in all our terminology, the first question is not what does it mean, but who uses it, who uses which terminology for which purposes. I share, in a way, Carrier's dream of the coming transform I quote of the coming transformation of Western art history when seen as a transcultural project. But this does not solve the problem of dealing with global contemporary art, which only emerged twenty years ago and in fact eliminates the very distinct otherness of non Western artists <coughs> or cultures, which is the subject of his book. So his uh, his his project is to um, step over the frontiers between one culture and the other. But this means one has to have a notion that this is different culture from this culture. This, however, in the global art praxis has become another project, another subject. It may even be illusory to conceive of an art history which is written as a history of what is considered as being outside, beyond, and after any history in the old sense. So I enjoy the following. What is the history of the contemporary? The history of the contemporary, and this you can read in many books today, is not the early history before art became contemporary, but is the history inside the contemporary. The contemporary as being a history, which I would like to uh, embark in the discussion later on, which is a very interesting. There are, of course, excuses like Julian Stalapras in his very nice book on the story of contemporary art. So you replace history by story because that's the only thing which you can tell at the moment. So I think history has become a controversial topic inside the discussion of global art or the globalization of the arts. But what does this mean? How do we move on? I therefore would like to return to a book of mine, which in its first edition of 1984, already mentioned, was entitled The End of the History of Art, with question mark. The book was often misunderstood as an essay about the discipline of art history, but it presented quite a different argument which may be summarized as follows. Contemporary art leaves art history. After art history had been so long a frame of reference that even had been accepted by modern art 
avant-garde when they wanted to redirect the course of art history. So the argument was what happens in contemporary art when artists decide no longer to continue the course of art history but to step out of art history altogether and still do art. In fact, I borrowed my title from a book of the French artist Erwin Fischer with the title L'Histoire de la Eternité, in which he uh, made a perf in which he reports on a performance in the Saint de Pompidou in saying, I am no longer the slave of art history, I am not against art history, I am not leading art history into the future, I am outside art history. And this, I think, was in the early 80s a daring expression, which today sounds different and must be rediscussed. Today, the third version of my book in English is entitled Art History After Modernism, but follows the same argument. You see here two, um, uh, two shots from Gary Hill's uh, installation, and it is very strange that this book has not caused any discussion in the United States, so it was published in Chicago. The question is, with other words, and my question was, and still is in a new way, with other words, whether new art still is considered to prolong or to continue the path of a master narrative that anyway was a Western story. The question of the role or not role of art history is intimately linked to the question of art as a concept to be sure a modern and a western concept so far. Does art as we know it as a pre-established notion lend itself to be globally expanded or to put it differently will the global art practice dissolve a unified common art concept instead of globalizing that art concept? I wish to say very emphatically when I speak like this this is no horror scenario and no apocalyptic complaint except for people who want to stop the course of time it's a question which in other parts of the world is imbued with euphoria and hope since they want to enter the mainstream stage of the art world so for instance in the China edition of my book, The End of the History of Art, there is a long quotation, and I asked what it means. It's in that they think, and indeed they are right, I encourage the Chinese readers not to copy Western art history, but to enter art history with their own premises and be it on their own. Uh, but I wanted not to finish with, with such uh, retrospective, but instead there is one book with which I want to finish and which I think is really a landmark in art history. It's very hard to see it. It's uh, proceedings of the last international congress in the history of art with the title, which unfortunately you cannot read well, Crossing Cultures, Conflict, Migration and Convergence. A congress which took place in 2008 in Melbourne. And the proceedings collect 224 contributors from all over the world. Uh, I think that this volume really changed the discussion of art history, not accidentally in Australia, where the subject of global art is of special concern today. This is uh, something we, we should uh, remind ourselves that this topic does not look equal in all parts of the world. The proceedings are edited by Janie Anderson, who is an expert in Venetian painting, but has proved such a broad view that this uh, Congress volume has no counterpart in any other uh, volume on art history so far. 
I would like to end with um, a hint, a glimpse of section 18, because section 18 in the same Congress volume has a title, Contemporaneity in Art and its History. You see again this problem. And uh, the editor of this section is Terry Smith, uh, born Australian, who um, directs a very sensational department of artistry in Pittsburgh, where he has uh, uh, called in and invited curators and art critics from other parts of the world, and they all teach in the same department in Pittsburgh. So he's, he, is, uh, he has written several books on contemporaneity, and uh, he is also in this section um, really the leader of the present discourse on how to deal, how art history can deal with contemporary art. In the same section, there is an essay, an essay of Alex, Alexander Albero, Periodizing Contemporary Art. This is also interesting, Periodizing Contemporary Art. This is um, maybe a naive uh, thing, but if you look at Sotheby's and Christie's auction catalogs, you will find expressions such as early contemporary and late contemporary. This is very interesting. Late <laughs> so the urge to introduce something which structures this kind of ominous amorphous contemporaneity. <laughs> and I will uh, finish my very short and very provisional essay with a quotation by Alexander Albert. I quote, The hegemony of the contemporary must now be recognized. But so too must be the fact <coughs> that what constitutes the period remains open and unsettled, subject to a battlefield of narratives and stories. Thank you.